Warning, this content may be upsetting or disturbing to some audiences. She sees a baby arm sticking out from the woman's. Detectives, what are some of the creepiest cases you have worked on? All right, detective now but this happened when I was on patrol several years ago. Got a call to check the welfare of a guy whose neighbor hadn't seen him in a couple years. Why it took so long to report. But it was out in our rural area. Anyway, we roll up, and the windows are black with mold and flies. Car is parked in the garage. No signs of forced entry. Breach the door and find said guy wrapped up in a phone cord beside a toppled chair in his dining room. He was mummified and melting into the carpet. Barely recognizable as a human aside from his shape and clothes. The smell of him mingled with the inches of stagnant water in his basement from burst pipes and all the dead flies and mold. I'll never forget it. We also found two bags of groceries neatly packed on the floor in his kitchen. House was very tidy as well. No witnesses. Estranged from his family. Clearly had a cat but we never found its remains. Medical record indicated he had a heart condition. My theory is he was having a heart attack and tried to call 911 but never got to make the call. Perhaps the creepiest part? His mailbox was overflowing with past due bills and cancelled utility notices. The last one was a couple months old. I used to work as an EMT. When I first started I went on a prison call once, our PT had a medical issue, and on the way to our patient me and my partner witnessed another inmate eviscerate himself somehow. He was beating on his, his hospital cell door screaming for painkillers and how now you all have to take me to the hospital. And the nurses non-pulsed were like yeah we called someone, but don't sweat it this is like the third time he's tried this. Also we were warned not to try and go in and help him cause he would most certainly attack us. Dude has his intestines hanging out and entire staff seemed to think it was no big deal. Kinda crazy. I soon learned how messed up prison hospitals are, eventually I too became desensitized. I was a young cop at this time as well. It was a fire, later found to be intentionally started, and I was primary on it with another guy. Fire scenes usually consist of making sure all residents are out of the building, taking down the information of all people so that you can account for residents, blocking off streets so the firemen can work, noting which police department and fire department personnel are at scene etc. Fire department is doing their thing and we're canvassing all of the people at scene to see who is a resident of the building and also for possible witnesses. One thing they always harped on in academy is that arsonists will many times return to the scene. So I see this guy on the perimeter, pacing back and forth for a while. I make my way over to him and start up a conversation. I find out he used to be a resident of the second floor apartment and the landlord recently kicked him out. Huge red flag, immediately hand him off to detectives. Ended up being the guy who set the fire. This was one of my favorite achievements in my career, because of what would follow. It wasn't until years later that my friend whose uncle was the senior detective on that job, told him the story, and gave all the praise to me. Hearing that in a random conversation years later was more gratifying than any award I could have been given. After we handle our business, we're just standing across the street watching fire department do their job. A huge blast on the third floor blows a firefighter out of the top floor window, and we immediately hear his co-workers screaming. I'm getting chills typing this. I immediately call for an ambulance. I help them wheel the stretcher over the fire hoses etc to the fireman. He ended up hitting a lower roof on the way out the window that ultimately caused his death by internal injuries. After the fire was put out, we responded to the hospital. I'll never forget the look on the faces of the firemen who were sitting at his bedside after he was pronounced dead, all covered in soot and crap from the fire. Side note. It came full circle when I married my wife whose father and brother both worked with him and were very close with him. I wanna say it was Foo Fighters my hero, but some song came on the radio when I was driving home and it turned my world upside down. Detective here. Had an assault job few years back, woman went to a fancy dress party, attacked on her way home. Doing inquiries on the street we luck out, find this neighbor with CCTV, captures the guy jumping her and dragging her into a front lawn. She was wearing a little red riding hood costume, so she was easy to spot. She'd been drinking, couldn't remember how she got home. Checking possible routes we find a rundown housing complex nearby and found more CCTV of her stumbling home alone. Hood up, headphones in, she's oblivious when he suddenly appears from the shadows behind her, watching her, hiding behind corners, then following her again. He keeps getting to within touching distance of her and then backing off. Perpetrator has a black furry hooded coat up over his head, is completely covered head to toe, looks like a wolf. The whole was thing very surreal. 
Anyway that wasn't the creepiest thing, we managed to trace her back to a well-known fast food place a few blocks away. Turns out Wolfman was in there for over two hours before she walked in, loitering in the queues, bailing out at the last minute, standing in the corner watching girls come in. Guy was waiting for his perfect target. I bet he didn't believe his luck. Some of the creepiest footage I've ever seen was of when she walks in. Restaurant had HD footage. I'm not kidding you, he was licking his lips. Didn't take his eyes off her once. Followed her out. The rest we already knew. Detective here, attached to a coastal town with a fishing wharf. Started work one day when we get a call from the water police who have responded to an abandoned boat floating off the coast. They have towed it into the bay where they requested our assistance and they would advise us further on arrival. We head down thinking someone had stolen the boat or something else routine. When we get there we are told that no one went further than the entrance before it was sealed off as a crime scene. We have a quick look below the deck and see why. Three people, clearly dead with one slumped over the wheel one on the floor and the other in a chair. No struggle, no injuries and nothing out of place. Completely silent other than the water on the hull and the fenders squeaking against the police launch. Turned out to be an accident. Lack of upkeep on the very old engine meant fumes leaked in and the three were poisoned, at which point the engine just ran until the diesel was gone. It's my husband's story, he is a detective. Someone dumped a body in an alley right by the PD, but in a spot that no one frequented. So after a few days in midsummer heat the body melted so bad they couldn't ID by looks or tattoos, just the clothes and hair, and DNA once they figured out who she was. Long story short it was a serial killer who had dumped her and they found CCTV of him stalking people at the local shopping center right after he dumped the body. They watched him spend over four hours walking around, leaving to his car and changing clothes and hat and going back in, following the woman for a bit, changing his mind. He left empty-handed, and ended up getting caught a couple states away the following week. Creepiest part for me was that I went shopping there the same day. Made me thankful for all the situational awareness training I got from my dad, also a detective. Made my husband more paranoid, but that's a different story. Not a detective but I know a creepy case. A friend of mine grew up in a big family house with her immediate family plus an uncle and grandparents. Sometimes her and her brother would wake up with things written on their faces in permanent texta. Just random phrases nothing too shocking. The kids were about 8 or 9 years old, they both denied doing it and no one looked any further into it. Anyway eventually the uncle is killed in his bed, stabbed to death. The police investigate and it turns out there's a dude living in their roof. Someone replied, my aunt separated from her husband and kicked him out, he was a alcoholic and an abuser. He would stalk her and be a pest basically. She hadn't heard from him for a few days. The ex had been in the attic for about two weeks, someone came home early I think and caught him. My mom said she was actually very calm about it all. He was arrested and they seen and heard from him sporadically. This kid, smart kid, Chinese student coming to America for school on an engineering scholarship I believe. Was dating a girl during undergrad, but they broke up so he could go to grad school at an Ivy League. She started talking to someone else a while after they broke up and he caught wind of it. He bought an airsoft gun and some knives online, next day air shipped them to his apartment, drove back to where his ex lived and staked out her house, taking meticulous notes about the comings and goings, when his ex was home, when her roommate was home. He went and knocked on the door when just the roommate was home, brandished the airsoft gun like it was a BB gun and negotiated his way in. He bound and gagged the roommate and waited for his ex to get back. When she finally got back, he forced her at gunpoint to sit in a chair, where he tied her up and taped over her mouth. He stabbed her in the neck once and then just stared at her, expecting that to kill her instantly, like a movie or video game. When it didn't, he stabbed her, I don't know how many more times, but a lot more. To me the creepy part is the level of planning that he did. I can understand a crime of passion, but this was so dispassionate. To have enough time to order your murder weapons online and have them delivered, then drive hours to the destination of your murder and plan it out, and at no point get the feeling that you shouldn't follow through with this act, to me that's the sign of a true sociopath. Insurance adjuster here. I'm not a detective, but I do lots of fraud investigations. The ones that aren't fraudulent sometimes just turn out to be really weird. The winner for me hands down is the man who claimed he was terrorized by mole people. We had a laugh about the adjuster potentially trying to pad their claims count because this man filed 60 claims in about 7 months. For context the average is like 1 a year for most policies. After talking with this gentleman, 
I no longer had doubts. My in-person interview was about two hours. I had more than enough in the first five minutes and was trying to leave for most of it, but he kept blocking the door or directing me the wrong way to keep the mole people off my scent. It was kind of sweet in a twisted way, he genuinely thought the mole people would come after me if I didn't follow his rules. He directed me to park my company car about a mile away on a concrete parking flat he had made. We couldn't walk on the dirt road there, the mole people constantly changed where it went. The claims he filed were all in similar veins. The mole people moved his car every night with magnets and damaged the suspension and the noise kept our insured awake. They'd steal his hubcaps and put them back before they thought he would notice, but he noticed and they were covered in scratches from being pulled through the dirt. They would use long thin sticks from underground to siphon gas or wiper fluid or oil, but never more than a few drops. And for every one of these things he would file a claim which would inevitably be well below his deductible. We decided there was no fraud, but a call to adult protective services was merited. There was this guy who liked to shoot turtles on a pond on his property. He sees a turtle and shoots it two times with a .22 rifle. He had a hunting dog that would go fetch the turtles. He would make turtle soup with them. The dog goes out and gets the turtle and an arm pops up. The turtle he shot was the back of the man's head who was dead in the pond. The guy who fell into the pond might have had an accident or car trouble and slipped in the clay and hit the water at night the day after Christmas while drunk. The cops rule it a drowning. The body had water in his lungs and his blood had pooled, lividity, was at an angle due to him face down in the pond. There was a website that the parents had, I couldn't find it, that said that the guy shooting the turtles murdered the guy by shooting him in the head and dumping him in the pond. I used to work with a retired LAPD beat cop of 30 years in his retirement fund money gig working on an ambulance. He told me this story that sent chills down my spine. He pulls over this sedan for expired tags, and neither the driver or passenger has any paperwork, driving illegally and they're both acting shady as hell, so he calls for backup, detains them, and searches the car. He finds two dead young teenage girls in the trunk. They're naked, bound, and gagged and had been mutilated, and there was tons of devices obviously meant for torture. He calls in the homicide detectives, and the cavalry comes, the two guys are hauled away to jail, and his day wraps up after all the normal procedures and paperwork has been filed. And he says that was the last he ever heard of that case. Nothing. No subpoenas. No testimony to a grand jury. No interviews for the homicide detectives. No stories in the paper. Nothing. He said it wasn't his normal area and didn't know the other cops and detectives that showed up, so that it's possible it just got lost in the enormity of the LA justice system, but he always wondered if there weren't some shady things going on. Private investigator here. Looking into a liability stabbing case. They were blaming the apartment complex for the resident getting stabbed by another resident. Turns out the dude was planning a mass shooting and was part of multiple right-wing white supremacist guy, wanted to attach a gun to a drone and kill a ton of people. Instead, he was so racist he couldn't help but stab his black neighbor before he pulled it off. His social media was essentially a manifesto and the cops found a bunch of firearms laid out, fully loaded and ready to go. I feel bad for the neighbor but their getting stabbed likely saved multiple people's lives. My boyfriend was the detective in this case. An officer doing a wellness check on an elderly woman spoke with her son. He said she was out at the moment, but she was doing well. He spoke in detail about what she was up to lately and all that. The officer noticed a strong smell coming from the yard though. I'm sure you see where this is going, as I don't think pretending a deceased relative alive to keep receiving their benefits is uncommon. The officer turned the case over to a detective, my boyfriend, who returned with a warrant. There were two houses, a main house, and a small apartment style house in the backyard where the mother once lived. When they entered, the son seemed calm. Showed them right to the mother continued to speak as if she was still alive and well. In the bed, they found the body, that had clearly been there for a long time. It was like a putrid puddle. The stench was unbearable. The son adamantly refused that she was dead. Insisting she had just been up and around the main house yesterday. I learned this story about from my boyfriend as an explanation as to why he always uses so much cologne, air fresheners, scented fabric softeners, etc. The smell is apparently something you never forget. My uncle was a cop. Essentially they got a call to a house. The neighbors had called the police and told them there was a strong odor coming from the apartment next door. They got a little worried. As this was an older woman, who only really left her home for essentials. They knocked on her door and she wouldn't answer. 
After many times knocking and calling, no answer. So they had the landlord unlock her door. They weren't necessarily thinking she was dead initially. Not sure how. It seems fairly obvious. They get inside, and the odor is just awful. Like burnt hair and cooked meat. The woman was taking a shower. She went to adjust the heat to be more hot. She slipped and fell on a loofah that was on the floor of the bath. And hit her head on the tap. Somehow in the fall she managed to turn the heat tap way too much. Essentially. She passed out. And then died from brain hemorrhaging. And then the hot shower boiled her. The hot water was running on her for about a day and a half. The tenants said that they were wondering why there was very limited hot water in the small apartment. Which was downtown above a bar. So it wasn't like they had separate piping. So to sum it all up, old woman died in her shower. Hot water turned her into pulled pork. But like mushy pulled pork. Yeah my uncle offered to show me pictures he had of it. I'm pretty desensitized to gore. As I follow many communities that deal with that. But I just don't think I'd be able to handle that. Still. To this day, one of the grossest things I've ever heard. Not a detective, but a forensic computer examiner for my local sheriff's department. I work closely with detectives and do lots of investigative work, so I feel I can accurately contribute to the conversation. Despite what the title suggests, a lot of my work is actually based on cell phone dumps. I once got a request from a detective to dump a guy's phone because he was attempting to sell our county jail jumpsuits. Don't ask me why, I wouldn't know why anyone would want to buy one, or how he even got a hold of one. So I did what I'm supposed to and dumped his phone's data into a report for the detective to go through. Problem was, there was way more on the phone than what we had bargained for. Turns out the guy was really into underage girls. To the point that he had thousands of images of CP on the device. So I called the detective up and informed him that he was going to need another warrant to cover the CP for the device. So he did, and began creating a CP case against the guy. Several days later it was time for the guy's prelim hearing for the county jumpsuit sales. He left the courthouse after the hearing and was immediately re-arrested for the CP violations. He had a backpack on him with three more phones in it. I was given said phones to dump for the new CP case. Same amount of CP on all three devices as on the first one. This wasn't necessarily a super creepy bone chilling case, but it sure as hell makes you realize how much of that stuff is actually out there. And it's hidden in plain sight a lot of the time. They were undercover in a mob and gathered enough evidence to search a house the guys used a lot, the search led them to a basement filled with water halfway up the stairs. They shone flashlights and didn't see anything at first, then saw something glinting in the water. They turned to go up the stairs to get a brighter light and along the walls and the door frame were gouges, the back of the door too. They got their bright lights and went back down and it turns out the bad guys had two crocodiles in there and when someone pissed them off they put them in the basement and locked the door. Gouges had skin particles in them. Was by far the craziest and creepiest case I heard and there's quite a few cops in the family. This happened when I was a newer cop on patrol, long before I became a detective. I was working midnights in a neighborhood with a high violent crime rate, and we got sent to a dispute at a bar. This wasn't just any bar, we always referred to it as the Star Wars Cantina because it was always a sh show. We stopped a snatch in progress in the dirt alley behind the same bar not long after this. I was working with a female that night. We make our way through the bar systematically booting people out, and get to the bathrooms. I open the door to the men's room and it's empty, single stall bathrooms. My female partner goes to open the women's bathroom door, but it's locked. She knocks on the door and a female says, I'll be out in a minute. We advise her that the bar is closing, bars close at 4 AM in NY. After a couple of minutes we begin to grow impatient. Female partner knocks on the door again and the female agrees to open the door. When she comes out, we ask her what took so long. She's not providing any substance in her answers. She's wearing tight yoga pants, and we notice that she has a large bulge in the back of her pants and crotch. We believed she was either doing drugs in the bathroom and shoved the rest in her pants or that it was a weapon. When we question her about it, she's very evasive and won't answer. Female partner begins to search her. As she pulls back the female's pants and shines her flashlight down to look, my partner says, hell. She sees a baby arm sticking out from the female's vag and up through her butt cheeks. This chick had been drinking and smoking crack all day. She had a stillborn and continued to stay at the bar and smoke crack. When the ambulance arrived, they went back into the bathroom with the female and pulled the rest of the baby out of the female and into the toilet bowl. 
The baby was completely formed, except it never formed a head. It was just sunken in around the neck. I've seen some crazy stuff in my career like brutal homicides etc but that one always stands out the most.